Hello, Quant City. This is Yoshimi, your classmate, reporting on a topic designed to create discussion. As a professor would say, more is learned from failure than success. Thus, I will spend this voice thread talking about BlackBerry, analysis of a downfall. The company BlackBerry was originally called Research in Motion, but later renamed after its famous product, the BlackBerry mobile phone. First, I will explain the history behind its sudden rise in popularity. Then, we will analyze what happened to bring its equally sudden demise. RIM was a Canadian startup birthed in 1984. Small in size, it was located for a number of years in a strip mall above a pizza joint. With little funds, but with stellar engineering talent, the company struggled to exist. Later, Mike Lazardis, one of the co-founders, was joined by a Harvard MBA graduate, Jim Basili, who helped finance the company's expansion, and the two became co-CEOs. From the beginning, the leadership distrusted marketing, stating that he, Mike Lazardis, would not allow marketing to dumb down the engineer's product. This, as you will see later, turned out to be one of the company's weaknesses. The startup would explore a number of technologies, but none took hold until one glorious day, RIM discovered its golden egg. Engineering developed a breakthrough new mobile device in the late 1990s that allowed the user to send emails remotely without having to be in front of a computer. The Model 950 released in 1999 was RIM's first product success. This was the mobile device that allowed the user to send emails on the go but did not do much else. Yet nothing like this existed and appeared the world was ready and waiting for this product. This allowed businesses to continue to work outside the office. Overnight, RIM was catapulted into fame. Model 6210, released by RIM by 2003, integrated phone on an easy-to-use PDA that included its signature email. The world now had a smartphone, and it never again would be the same. Nineteen ninety nine to two thousand seven was Blackberry's heyday. The company did not have or need consumer marketing. Instead, sales representatives would give these devices to CEOs and other company leaders asking them to give the product a try. Soon orders were flooding in. Carrying a Blackberry was seen as a status symbol. This led to a crossover effect to the consumer market who wanted to use a Blackberry for their personal use. No advertising was deployed, and it seemed it was not needed based on the success of the current sales climate. However, 2007 was a date that Apple entered the phone market, and the first cracks in RIM's company's armor began to form. The staff did not understand the level of threat that the iPhone posed on their market shares. A major mistake was the continued insistence that advertising was not needed because BlackBerry's name will sell itself. Sales representatives will soon tell people that iPhones was just a toy. But consumers voted their preference with their pocketbooks and chose the iPhone. Unbelievably, RIM still did not make strategic adjustments to this new market landscape. Among RIM's internal failings include a lack of interaction between marketing and engineering groups. In technology companies, it is essential that marketing and engineering work in close coordination as can be seen from each group's emphasis. Marketing determines customers' needs and wants. Engineering fulfills customers' needs by producing products that it wants. This cooperation was especially needed when the market suddenly became highly competitive. In this new paradigm, there was not the time nor patience from the marketplace for engineers guessing at what technology the world will want next. Tragically, from the beginning of the company, there was a distrust between the two internal organizations that needed each other, leading to devastating consequences. The management displayed a number of critical failings. 
Unable to manage a changing company, the co-CEOs did not make the critical adjustments to operational styles needed for the success of a company that was reaching the next stages of growth. For instance, at its peak, the employee rank grew in size from 2,000 to 12,000 in just four short years. Growth was uneven and awkward. At one point, the company was so top-heavy with management that only 5 to 10 percent of the population was working engineers. Furthermore, the management was not able to keep up with the ever-changing consumer demands. Some of these mistakes were avoidable with good communication between groups. As an example, in 2007, the marketing group has strong evidence that consumer tastes were turning to candy bar-shaped smartphones. Yet in 2008, the engineering group ignored the studies and produced the Pearl Flip. A flip-style phone had been popular many years earlier, but considered out of date by current consumers. Predictably, sales were a flop. Management failure to respond with strong R&D resulted in yet more devastating consequences. Ironically, the words R&D became synonymous with a slow-moving organization filled with people who did not want to work anymore. RIM lost its visions and values. These attitudes impacted the company through a lack of innovation and a loss of quality control, and the products developed under these conditions reflected it. Phones such as the Bold 9000, Torch 9800, Z10 were each riddled with design problems, quality issues, and delayed release times. In 2011, RIM released a playbook tablet to respond to the iPad 2, declaring that amateur hour is now over. To the shock of most customers, the playbook even lacked RIM signature email, calendar, and content capabilities. At this point, many software developers gave up on RIM products. RIM's rise and fall was fast and spectacular. Keep in mind that the company had its beginnings in 1984 and produced the first hot product in 1999. From 1999 to 2007, the company dominated the world in mobile devices and its stock price and market capitalization reflected it. Stocks reached over $140 per share in 2007. But with developing problems with the iPhone release, the company never seemed to find its footing again and its shares took a pounding. In 2013, the stock sank to a 15-year low of $6 per share. In response, the company removed the two co-CEOs and placed them instead on the board, then internally promoted their COO, Thorsten Hines, to the position of CEO in January 2012. Many felt that this would not result in structural changes in the leadership needed to develop a new direction. In September 2013, Heinz instituted a mass layoff of 40% of the workforce and morale of remaining employees suffered. Work quality plummeted. Another change in leadership occurred in November 2013, where John Chen took the helm and honestly stated that the company had a 50% chance of long-term survival. It is still yet to be seen if RIM will make the Apple Steve Jobs like comeback. Only the future would tell. On a brighter note, I have had the privilege of working with many of the best young minds, including engineers, scientists, technicians, and engineering interns. I'm proud to say that my intern was accepted to four highly acclaimed graduate schools. His goal was to obtain a PhD in engineering and eventually get his MBA in business. Go for it, Adam. The young today are tomorrow's leaders, and by learning from our generation's lessons, they will usher in a brighter future. Thank you, Quant City. I look forward to seeing you in class.